Hello and welcome to South Asia Chat brought to you by the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. Our guest today is Mr. Nandan Unikrishnan, Distinguished Fellow at the Observer Research Foundation, New Delhi. Mr. Unikrishnan is a foreign policy expert specializing in Russia, Central Asia, and other four Soviet territories. An alumnus of Jawaharlal Nehru University, he began his career as a journalist with the Press Trust of India and was its Moscow bureau chief for three years. Today, we speak to him about the role of Russia in India-China relations, especially in the backdrop of the recent skirmish in Eastern Ladakh. Thank you, Mr. Unikrishnan, for joining us today. So I'd like to start by asking you, what has Russia's role been in the recent confrontation between China and India in Eastern Ladakh? Well, uh, we have to start with the fact that Russia uh, has a long-standing relationship with India and recognizes that uh, India is uh, quite averse to any public mediation between India and any other power. So I don't think there would have been any role in trying to mediate between uh, India and China in the classical sense. But yes, Russia is not uh, interested in uh, uh, hostilities uh, between uh, China and India. Uh, in fact, it goes against Russia's current interests to have any kind of instability between these two uh, countries with whom it has uh, very good relations with both of them. And I would suspect that if there was any effort to uh, try and uh, sort of diffuse the tensions between India and China, this would have been strictly, strictly in the background. Uh, and it would not be, I don't think it would even be a post office role. I think they would at best uh, nudge the two parties to talk to each other. But I am told, now I don't know whether this is true, so uh, take it under that advice. But I am told that uh, the Russians did play some kind of role in the release of the 10 odd Indian soldiers early on, soon after the, I mean, as the, uh, after the clash that took place in uh, Galwan. So how would you assess the equation between Russia and China vis-a-vis -vis Russia and India? I was reading an, a comment by you recently where you said that, you know, Russia will um, back China on many issues, but not all. So there are irritants between them as well. So could you just elaborate on this dynamic between Russia, China, uh, Russia, India? Yes. No. One is, uh, again, a little bit of background. Russia, uh, Russian worldview from a state position uh, sees a vital role for China, India in working and other parties also, not only China and India, but they see these as critical, uh, having a critical role in working out a security architecture for Asia. Originally it was for Asia, now it has expanded to the new concept of greater Eurasia. So uh, the Russians believe that without the Chinese or the Indians, uh, no stable architecture can be evolved. Uh, I'm not getting into whether the United States is present or not. I'm just talking of the countries that are geographically in this region. And uh, if you come from that uh, background, you can see that the Russians are quite uh, uh, dismayed by the fact that India and China are uh, constantly, you know, in this state of tension with each other. Uh, given Russia's relationship with other great powers, it is being pushed by the West. Uh, well, the pushing started with NATO's expansion, but it definitely uh, came to a peak after the uh, Ukrainian crisis, uh, when Russia took 
back or annexed whichever you prefer depending on where you stand uh, crimea uh, sort of engulfed crimea back into the russian fold as the russians like to say uh, it it left uh, russia pretty much with little choice although russia had started uh, a formal pivot to the east in 2011 uh, it started a little earlier but uh, mr putin came out with a series of articles in uh, the izvestia newspaper shortly before he was re-elected as president uh, enunciating this whole concept of eurasia and the need for russia to pivot to the east and develop its relationships with the eastern nations uh, immediately after the crisis in ukraine uh, i think this pivot to east became more of a pivot to uh, china you know it was there was always a strong relationship with india but uh, uh, the rest of asia it became a pivot to china in the last 2 uh, 3 years i think there is a significant effort at correcting that tilt and russia has uh, activated its relationships with asean it's reaching out to japan and south korea uh, but undoubtedly china looms large in its uh, foreign policy and i would guess that after the united states that is the country with which uh, on which they expend maximum energy maintaining that relationship uh india would be a close uh sort of competitor for russian attention uh, in the foreign policy sense behind china uh russia does not i mean russia understands that there is a uh, differential in terms of economic capacity military capacity between china and india but that is not the reason why uh it uh wants this relationship with india it wants this relationship with india because in case a diarchy does appear even if it's an asymmetrical one russia believes that it is countries like india russia maybe a few others that would be able to balance and give each other strategic space so as to be able to uh, conduct uh their own policies uh firstly of course domestic as well as a uh, foreign and they would be able to maintain uh, strategic autonomy from both these uh, centers of power which is presumably the united states and uh, china which is why uh russia feels that its relationship with india is also critical uh, in recent times of course china and russia have become very very close uh and it is not just economically they have uh, conducted joint military exercises uh they have uh, uh, executed joint patrols in the sea of japan uh with their aircraft so there is a fair amount of closeness uh but if you now draw the comparison with india uh they have done all these things plus plus with india Uh, now if we come to the areas of difference there are irritants in the relationship with uh, china between russia and china these are not uh, uh, irritants that are going to derail the relationship as of now but these are green shoots and i suspect these will develop uh, these are not going to disappear if we start you uh, know you know if we looking at a map the first area of difference which is emerging is the arctic chinese uh, declarations of a new polar silk route all these have upset uh, the russians who believe that uh, firstly they see the arctic as their domain but they understand that they have to rub shoulders with the usa canada norway and others and so therefore the arctic council uh, is for them the deciding uh, body of how the arctic should develop or what should be the rules of engagement and all others are merely observers and they should follow those rules so china attempting to uh, play this forward game in the arctic is something that the russians are not very happy with 
the second area where there would be uh, differences again if you come down would be central asia uh, they have in a sense competing interests because russia views central asia as its to put it crudely soft underbelly and will protect its strategic interests there uh, and does so it's a security interest primarily but china with its expansion economically particularly the bri is also going to start looking at protecting its investments in the region so it will also acquire a security role and that uh, is where the friction is likely to take place and the ability to influence the third area that if again again if you go down southwards is for example the south china sea uh, the russians are contrary to popular belief the russians are not with the chinese on the south china sea if you look at russia's actions they in fact have a joint venture uh, oil exploration joint venture with the vietnamese in the south china sea they supply vietnam with uh, submarines now we all know that those submarines uh, vietnam is not going to use against the united states or against uh, its neighbors the only country that it will use it against or intends to use it against is china so uh, there is already you can see daylight then between uh, china and russia on some strategic issues uh, do tell me if i am running over time no no please <laughs> no. please and uh, the final uh, straw as it were would be a domestic area but i'll have to go north again which is in the russian far east uh, the russians definitely want the chinese to help with development of the far east this is a vast area uh, you know more than uh, Six uh, almost six million square kilometers, I think. No, I I'm getting confused now. Anyhow, it's a huge uh, area with only six million people. That's right, uh, six million people, and uh, with that kind of density of population, it's obviously not uh, easy for Russia to think in terms of developing that area, which is relatively underdeveloped if you compare it to the European part of Russia. and at the same time it requires resources and china is the neighboring country which has the resources and ability to help but of course they are worried about chinese uh, overtaking the region uh, not only through resources but also human beings so uh, that is a concern that the russians have right now in fact that is not a danger at all because there are about uh, less than 100000 chinese uh, citizens on russian soil there uh, and in fact there are more russians across the border because medical facilities and uh, other things are better in china right now so a lot of russians put their uh, residences out for rent and go and stay in china but the fact is the long term prospect is something that worries uh, the kremlin and uh, finally of course they have a history uh, the chinese have not you know, they still teach in schools about the territories that have been lost in an unequal treaty to russia recently when vladivostok was celebrating its uh, anniversary 160th i think or something like that uh, the chinese objected the russian embassy in uh, beijing had to pull down some celebratory messages so there are uh, frictions between the two which right now of course is overshadowed by their common desire to resist uh, the united states and to prevent what they consider uh, rebirth of a hegemon but uh, the russians are worried that in that process they may see the birth of another hegemon to the south of their borders so uh, amidst this galwan crisis uh, you know our indian defense minister Ms. mr rajnath singh visited russia to expedite the supply of the s400s and other defense equipment uh, but since then of course there has been a de escalation at the border so do you think indians can continue to rely on russia for its security amidst its deepening strategic partnership with china and also is russia willing to open to making some of its weapons in india to enhance its reliability to india 
Well, to be, uh, one is we have to distinguish uh, what we mean by security. I mean, if we, are, if we want to see a repeat of 1971, where the Russian fleet was deployed in the uh, southern parts of Bay of Bengal, uh, I don't think that is likely to happen. If there is a conflict between India and China, I don't think the Russians will want to get involved with boots on the ground uh, on the Indian side, definitely not on the Chinese, but not on the Indian side. So that is one aspect. The second is the Russians are not going to uh, stop the supply of uh, arms that are critical for India's defense and that includes uh, spare parts and uh, all the necessary equipment to keep uh, uh, weapons platforms functional. I don't think we have reached that stage where Russia at this stage would even consider uh, such a possibility. So all these newspaper reports about China putting pressure on Moscow and all would, in fact, if such a thing did happen, uh, I think it would only have added irritation in Kremlin with China's wolf warrior diplomacy. As it is, they are upset. This would have only made it worse. So they are not likely to sus be susceptible to that. As far as uh, uh, the production of weapons is concerned, uh, Nitya, they are happy to produce in India. Right? Uh, the problem is, uh, I mean, I won't say it's their fault, neither is it India's, but we have two different systems. Uh, we want uh, uh, these things to be produced under the Make in India program. The Russians are quite happy to participate in it, but they don't, you know, their uh, weapon systems are all manufactured by uh, state owned corporations. They don't deal with private sector. So they are unused to the concept of the private sector and they will need guidance in that. Unfortunately, the guidance that they are getting is, uh, I mean, to be soft, subpar. It is not uh, really good, right? And that game India has to up. So I would, in fact, if I was to be uh, a judge on why this is not taking place, I would say you know, a substantial portion of the blame lies with India because we know the Russians desire to do it. We know they're willing to give you weapon systems and uh, they're willing to invest resources, but we are unable to prepare the ground for those uh, ventures to take off. For example, I'll tell you, we have signed a deal for helicopters. We have agreed that they will make three frigates in India. We have identified the slots for all this, but for some reason, these have still to, uh, I'm not saying the frigates will be made in five days, but the point is you have to at least start something somewhere. So that is taking uh, time. So I don't think it's a lack of desire on the Russian part. I think we have to up our game in terms of the way we approach it. And this is true incidentally, I mean, I'm sorry to veer off topic as it were, but this is true not just of uh, Russia. This is true of our relationships with almost every uh, country in the world, particularly in the weapons sector. And uh, it's also true of other civilian private sector projects. Yes. I mean, it's not as if the world is dying to rush to, to invest in India. The world wants to exploit the Indian market, yes. but India has not created the conditions right. for that right now. So we have a lot of work to do domestically to be able to grow our strength. I'd also like to ask you, what are your views on the RIC and its way forward in the present circumstances? This is a very, uh, uh, I mean, it's a very interesting question, but uh, I would say that this is something that uh, I don't really have an answer for. You know, as I said, RIC is a concept that in the Russian mind, is central to uh, uh, some kind of uh, working off, working out of uh, an Asian security system. Uh, I would, I mean, as an Indian, probably have no objection to that as a concept. I would also agree that you cannot really have any kind of stable uh, uh, security architecture 
in on Asian landmass without Russia, without China, without India. So, I mean, in principle, that is true. The problem, however, is the nature of the relationship between India and China. That is one. But more importantly to me, I think uh, where the Russians uh, need to uh, look at things slightly differently is, it is the nature of China. China has arrived at a stage on the world, uh, I mean, at the world stage, uh, where it believes it has arrived and it has the right and the might to do certain things and that other smaller countries have to just swallow it. Now that unfortunately is not something that is going to happen. So uh, there will come a time when the Russians will also be faced with that choice. I'm not saying of a direct choice between Russia and China, but faced with the choice with, for example, if uh, China starts pushing, pushing ASEAN countries or uh, even pushing India a bit too much, Russia will have to make a choice, display a choice. Today it displays its choice by giving India a nuclear submarine, which everyone knows India wants to use against the Chinese. And it collaborates with you in, pre pre in creating your own nuclear submarines, uh, the entire setup. So th they have made a choice, but that is an easy choice to make right now. The more difficult choice is ahead as China, I don't think is going to suddenly become a good boy and stop this expansionism of its own. So the Russians uh, have a tough time ahead. In that context, does RIC have a future? That is the question. And uh, I, I really don't have an answer. But given the pessimistic scenario that I've drawn, I don't know whether I would invest too much in that uh, anyway, concept. Anyway, it was a non-starter. I mean, nothing substantial has happened by the way of the RIC so far. Well, it was a non-starter to the extent that, let's be very honest with this. The Russians invested a lot of time and energy in it. But uh, the Indians are still not sure what can yes. come out of it. So they are not investing time and energy. Now, if you're trying to create a triangle and one angle is just not That's functional, it then it, it doesn't work. So uh, what has happened is that the Russians have developed a good relationship with India, a good relationship with China, but uh, the relationship between Russia and India, uh, between China and India is not a good one. And that is where there is another fear that Russians have. Not a fear, actually, maybe uh, what they're worried about is uh, about uh, India's growing relationship with the United States. Uh, they are not worried in terms of, uh, you know, that India will buy arms and all that. That, that, that is not something that uh, upsets them too much because they recognize that India wants to diversify, does not want to be dependent on one country. But uh, what really worries them is that uh, um, uh, India may be drawn into the circle of uh, the United States and the West and will then uh, slowly sort of the relationship between Russia and India would erode and then the Russians would lose one uh, significant partner that could give them strategic maneuverability vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese for example or even vis-a-vis -vis the Americans. So uh, there is a worry of the long term uh, in their minds but so far of course India has played the game fairly well. I think it's reassured them but uh, time will show as they say what and how this grows. And finally, also the trade relation between uh, China and Russia, it's almost 10 times more than that of India. I believe it's over $110 billion between China and Russia compared to just 10 billion between India and Russia. So how do you think this can be strengthened? You know, the economic ties between the two can be strengthened. Uh, you mean economic ties between Russia and India? Yes, yes. Well, one is that we have to understand that uh, while the fact that uh, 
India and Russia don't have a border has helped us because we have not fought wars with each other. But at the same time, it has distanced us from each other in an economic sense. We don't have a genuine trading route. But uh, in Soviet times, uh, we used to use the what is now being revived by the Modi government, the Vladivostok Chennai route. Uh, there used to be a, a shipping agency that used to run goods uh, up and down on that. Uh, but that may not be the most efficient route. The other route would probably be via Iran, but Iran is not doing us any favors. So they have just canceled the Chabhar Zaidan uh, train uh, agreement. So I don't know uh, what future that has. So given that land connectivity or sea connectivity is still uh, an issue, I would think that the way to strengthen the relationship currently is to A, increase cross-investment in industries of interest to each other. The second is to increase collaboration in uh, high technology areas. For example, I mean, we all know that uh, Russians are fairly advanced in robotics. They're fairly advanced in uh, artificial intelligence. They also have uh, developments, significant developments in nanotechnologies. Now, these are areas where we could uh, collaborate, we could learn from them. We could, uh, in fact, I would think that one of the best things to do would be to get Russian expertise on education, to call them in to set up uh, science and technology institutions in India. You know, we get a lot of help and collaboration with uh, Western universities on liberal arts. So you have a huge number of private universities that have cropped up. But science and technology is something that uh, needs to be addressed. And I think the Russians have a very robust and uh, strong uh, presence in these areas. And this is something that we could uh, think in cooperating. The third, of course, is that our defense relationship is not disappearing. It's going to be there. It may reduce, but it is going to be there. And the final thing is that uh, renewables and nuclear energy, these are the areas which again are not going to disappear. In nuclear energy, of course, the Russians are uh, ahead of most of the world in terms of collaboration with India. But even in renewables, this would be an area that we could uh, work together. So the possibility of strengthening the relationship is there but there is one fundamental weakness and that is the fact that uh, 80 percent or more probably of the indian economy resides in the private sector and the indian private sector is negligibly involved in the relationship with russia so if you have a government to government re relationship even at the economic level you will always have a limitation it is going to be very small. So if the leaderships on both sides uh, think out of the box, I mean, find solutions to get the Indian private sector into the relationship, then there is a chance of growing the economic relationship too. Thank you so much, Mr. Onikrishnan, for joining us. This was a very insightful conversation. Uh, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Nitya. You were listening to South Asia Chat brought to you by ISAS. If you wish to learn more about our work, please visit isas.nus.edu.sg.